This gallery focuses on the town of Aquaisulis, the Roman name for Bath. The displays introduce the people who lived and died in this flourishing town. Aquaisulis was only a small outpost of the vast Roman Empire, but it was a very special place because of the hot springs that rise here, which the Romans believed to be sacred. People travelled great distances to bathe in the healing waters and to consult the goddess of the hot spring, Sulis Minerva. Meet Vitalis, a young soldier who ended his days here in Aquaisulis. His tombstone tells us quite a bit about him. Julius Vitalis, Fabricienses Legionis Viginti, Victricis Dependorium Novem, Anorum Viginti. Julius Vitalis, armourer of the 20th Legion, Belgic tribesman, age 29. The Roman army is key to the story of Aquaisulis. The 20th Legion, which Vitalis belonged to, may actually have helped to build the site when Aquaisulis was a new Roman town. And the military remained a strong presence, as we know from the number of gravestones like this one. Vitalis himself was an armourer, so we see him preparing and sorting equipment. The Roman army consisted of soldiers from all corners of the empire. Vitalis came from Belgium and he gives us an idea of what an international flavour the place must have had back in Roman times. Not unlike today, in fact. There's another interesting sentence. His funeral paid for by the Guild of Armourers. Clearly, Roman soldiers had a sort of funeral club. Every soldier paid a subscription. And then, if the worst happened and you died far from home... Your old army pals would give you a decent burial paid for out of a central fund. The little bronze saucepan displayed in the showcase to the right gives us another intriguing link with the Roman army. This unusual little saucepan was found in the spring here in the Roman baths. But it comes all the way from Hadrian's Wall, the great Roman wall in the north of Britain. If you look very closely at the pattern on the side, you'll see it resembles the upper part of a fortified wall. This is one of four pans known from the Roman world that represent Hadrian's Wall. Susan Fox is the collections manager of the Roman Baths. We asked her to tell us how this little pan made its way into the spring at Aquaisulis. Well, soldiers actually had a patera as part of their kit. It was something that they would have drunk from or would have had their food served in. And so it was an essential part of what they carried when they were on the march. So one of the soldiers on Hadrian's Wall could well have purchased it there when they were in this amazing sort of windswept part of the country. And then either they got injured and came to Bath for convalescence or they came on holiday and they were so moved by perhaps being healed or by the sights and sounds of Bath that they actually threw the saucepan into the spring and dedicated it to Solis Minerva. We know from objects found here like coins and gravestones that people came to Aquaisulis from far and wide. But these human remains are particularly important because they give us clear scientific proof of a man who travelled here from a long way away. Susan Fox, Collections Manager at the Roman Baths. At the bottom of the case is a large lead coffin. It's a very odd shape because it's not actually the outside of the coffin, it's the inner lining. It would originally have been a lining of a wooden coffin and the wood rotted away before it was excavated. Above the lead lining is a skeleton of the man from the coffin and to the left of the skeleton is his reconstructed head. We don't know the man's name but we do know a little bit about him. We know that he was about 45 years old, we know he was quite wealthy and we know he came from the eastern Mediterranean. We know this because his bones show quite a bit of attrition so he wasn't a young man, he was at least 45 years old when he died and we know he was wealthy because he had caries or holes in his teeth and they were very worn. And this shows that he was actually having a fair bit of honey in his diet. 
which a poor person wouldn't have. And we know from DNA analysis that his mother's and his mother's ancestors came from the Eastern Mediterranean and also from oxygen isotope analysis of his teeth that he too came from the Eastern Mediterranean, probably around Syria. And this shows that he actually grew up there as a young child. We don't know what he was doing in Aquaesulis. He may have been just a wealthy traveller going around the empire. He may have been a trader coming here to sell his wares. We really have no idea. The remains also tell us about changing burial rituals. As well as the coffin and skeleton, you'll also notice two cremation pots displayed here. When the Romans first came to Britain, they were actually cremating their dead, so that means they were burning the body and just keeping the burnt remains. So this is what we see here. It was only in the 2nd and certainly in the 3rd century that they started to have inhumations or, or bury the whole body in the ground. And this was really with the influence of Christianity and belief in Mithras, which sort of emphasised the importance of, of keeping the whole body intact for the afterlife. The fact that the man in the lead coffin was buried in a coffin in the ground and that he was facing almost east suggests that he was a Christian. This grand stone head was probably made for the tomb of a wealthy townswoman in Aquaisulis. Its huge size shows what an important person she was. And so does its amazingly elaborate hairstyle, which was the height of fashion in the late 1st century AD. If you walk round the back, you'll get an idea of how the style was created. At the back, the hair is divided into thin plaits, then coiled into a heavy bun. At the front, a diadem of tiny curls arranged over a frame circles the face. This lady would have needed a highly skilled hairdresser to create a style like this. No doubt she brought a team of slaves with her to Aquaisulis to ensure all the comforts of daily life. But what do we know about their lives? As with all societies, you're going to get nice mistresses and you're going to get horrible mistresses and slave girls and slaves are going to be treated accordingly, really. What we do know is that slaves had no rights. They were very much seen as property of their owner and so they could be sold, they could be mistreated, but it was understood it wasn't the best thing to do, really. And a lot of owners as they were nearing the end of their life or as their slaves served a lot of time with them, they did actually free them and they became freed people. We don't know what kind of a mistress this lady was, just that she and her slaves formed part of the rich social mix of this lively spa town. This hoard of 17,655 Roman silver coins was found on an archaeological dig just 150 metres from here, in a small pit cut into the floor of a room. It is one of the largest hoards ever found in a Roman town. X-rays show that the coins were originally in eight bags. Although those bags had almost completely degraded, conservators at the British Museum were able to separate the coins bag by bag. Images from a scanning electron microscope showed that the bags themselves were made of leather. The coins had been carefully separated. Each bag contained different combinations of coin types with a different range of dates. Altogether, the coins were made between 32 BC and 274 AD. That's a period of 306 years. Nothing else was found with the hoard, and several ideas have been put forward that may explain it. One is that this may be accumulated wealth, passed on through a family. Another, that it may have been brought together by a tax collector. And a third, that it may reflect someone secreting away their money in troubled times. It may even be that we have not one hoard, but eight, all brought together into one place. Its value at the time is hard to pin down. The government was putting less and less silver into coins, resulting in strong inflation, and there are few surviving references 
to the price of goods and services. But we do have a clue. A few years after this hoard was closed, prices were fixed by imperial decree. A haircut might cost two of these coins, whilst a skilled craftsman might be paid up to 150 a day, or a live lion bought for 150,000. <coughs> to find out more about this amazing find, there is a special publication available in the shop at the end of your visit.